apologize for being late this morning. Uh, a little trouble getting the bulletin together. So, uh, but we're here now and we're ready to start, Daniel. Thank you, Keith, for uh, getting us kicked off there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> we're going to uh, be in Daniel chapter 2 this morning. And um, uh, uh, Caleb um, is, uh, of course, in southern Illinois. I uh, heard from him this morning. Um, his grandfather uh, did pass away uh, yesterday morning. And um, so uh, the funeral's this week, and they're planning to right now to be back uh, probably on, on Friday. So uh, let's pray for them. Um, they, they have had some snow up there, and they're expecting more snow, but he thinks that um, things should be clear enough for them to, to leave um, and, and return on Friday. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see, Daniel chapter 2, here we go. All right, so uh, what I'd like to do, I don't want to get too far ahead of, of Caleb, uh, but he did leave me some notes, and so I think the notes that he left me are, are going to uh, suffice uh, for the two classes that we have remaining before he returns. Uh, this morning, I'd like to look at uh, Daniel chapter 2. Um, verses 1 through 23. We want to look at Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the events surrounding that. <coughs> um, and where, where, we, where we are up until this time, we've kind of set the stage in chapter 1. Uh, we've introduced the character of Daniel, introduced Nebuchadnezzar as, as the king of Babylon and Daniel as um, one that has come from Jerusalem along with um, wise men and, and young men um, from the court in Jerusalem. Excuse me. Everybody remember to silence your cell phones. Um, and, uh, and we've seen this early conflict with Daniel where he said, uh, I don't want to defile myself and, and my friends. Uh, we don't want to defile ourselves with the king's food. And so, uh, he proved himself, uh, he and his friends, um, Hananiah, and Michelle, I'm trying to remember the, <laughs> the Jewish names, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. Uh, <laughs> um, he, he, they proved themselves through this that God was with them and that... God was taking care of them and that God was providing everything for them, including wisdom and knowledge. And we see in, um, in verse 17 of chapter 1, uh, As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And when they were brought before Nebuchadnezzar, uh, in verse 20 it says, And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. Um, so we've set the stage for the rest of the book, basically, where we see Daniel and his three friends, uh, Daniel especially, as being very, very important to uh, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and then to the subsequent kings as the per- Persians uh, take over later. So, uh, with that in mind, let's read chapter 2. Um, let's read down through verse 16 to begin with. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. 
You did not make known to me the dream and its interpretation. You shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or a Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Okay, we'll stop there for a second. Um, So, we understand (coughs) the idea here is that Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream. Actually, The ESV says, and I think the other translations say, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. And so that indicates to me that this was a recurring dream. This is something that he had had more than once. And it was such that it troubled him, that he could not sleep. So you you think of a nightmare or a night, night terror where... You know, you're, you're awakened from sleep and you can't, you can't get a good night's rest because this dream is so troubling. <laughs> um, so, he wants to know what this dream means. So obviously Nebuchadnezzar sees this dream as something significant. And that also lends itself to the idea that it was a recurring dream. It was something that um, he would have had several times. Um, And so he sees it as something significant, something he needs to know the meaning of. And so he calls all these wise wise men together, magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, the Chaldeans. Um, He calls them together and asks them to help. Um, Anybody know who the Chaldeans were? (laughs) Yes? Did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Anybody know who the Chaldeans were? Okay. Uh, yes? Okay. So, so in Babylon, in, in Babylon, there was a, an ethnic group known as the Chaldeans, and they were known for uh, this type of, of wisdom, being able to interpret dreams um, and uh, you know, perhaps uh, fortune-telling and, and things such as, such as that. And so that, that's who's referred to by the Chaldeans. So there were apparently magicians and enchanters and sorcerers apart from the Chaldeans, but the Chaldeans were a people known for this, this kind of wisdom. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, they could, and they were known for being able to interpret dreams. Um, what is odd about Nebuchadnezzar's request here, though? Okay, right. Okay, why? Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's calling on them to kind of know his thoughts, know know what's happened to him. Why do you think he is making this special request here? Not just somebody fake, not be okay. 
All right. Blowing smoke. All right. It would have to be somebody that is truly enlightened. Sorry. So perhaps he, he suspects that these people don't really know what they're talking about. Okay. And then they're not real, real dream interpreters. Okay. Uh, did I hear another answer? Okay. Uh, now, that's, of course, as we go through Daniel, <laughs> and, you know, the, one of the three answers to, uh, questions in Bible class is God, right? <laughs> right? Uh, the other, another one is Jesus. Um, why did I say three? Well, I guess the third one might be the Holy Spirit. Um, so, uh, God, of course, one of the themes of this book is that God is in control. And so everything that we see happening here, the hand of God is in. All right? Now, having said that, <clears throat> I wonder if the nature of this dream, the fact that this dream is recurring, Nebuchadnezzar sees something different here. I, it, it occurs to me that perhaps Nebuchadnezzar realizes that somebody is trying to tell him something. Somebody is trying to send him a message. And so his, perhaps his thought is, well, if somebody is trying to send me a message, I better make sure that whoever tells me what that message is, is hearing from the same somebody. Okay? And so, does anyone know, does anyone have any um, idea how these dream interpreters would work under normal circumstances? First, they, they tell us one thing. What do, they, what do they tell us they would normally do? Right, okay. So they, they would hear the dream, and then they would say, okay, well, this, that's, that's, this means this. This is going to happen. You're troubled by this. Um, you need to watch out for this, so on and so forth. <coughs> do you, does anyone know how they would do that? Have you ever heard of the, heard this before? Okay, so these Chaldeans and these dream interpreters, what they had, and they found actual uh, copies of this in uh, archaeological digs, and they would have a book of dream interpretation. <coughs> and so, as the dream is being told to them, they would say, "Oh, that seems significant. Okay, that oh, that means this. This is going to happen." Or this is referring to this that happened in your life, or this person, or you know, and. Uh, yeah, right, okay. So so there was a, 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 a kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence that they would, um, over the years, over the generations, they would come to determine that when somebody dreams X, that means Y in real life. And so they would give these interpretations. Well, Nebuchadnezzar wanted more than that. He didn't want them to just go into their book and come up with some interpretation. Perhaps he had done this before and it hadn't worked out. You know, he realized that, well, m maybe their book is not quite right. Who knows exactly where Nebuchadnezzar is coming from, but he realizes that it's not enough for them to simply look in their book and give him an interpretation. He wants to know that, <clears throat> let's see, um, he wants to know that their interpretation will be correct. And look at the um, look at the uh, uh, severity with which he gives both the threat and the reward and the promise. Um, it reminds us of, of the promises of God. You know, there's the curse and the promise, uh, the curse and the blessing. Right, this Nebuchadnezzar is doing the same thing here. We have we, he says, if you do not make it known to me, then I will you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be um, shall be laid in ruins. Sorry, my eyes are all screwed up. Um, but if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So there's no there's no middle ground here. There's no um, well, you know. Uh, if if you don't want to do it, that's fine. Or if you you know if you get it kind of right, then you know I'll I'll leave you alone. It's you, it's either death, a horrible death, and by the way, destruction for their household as well, and or great blessing, one or the other. And so they have every reason 
to want to do this for Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and I, I think that's the idea. He doesn't, he, wants to, he doesn't want to give them an out. Okay. <clears throat> um, but the Chaldeans say, well, you know, that's not how this works. And they're very insistent on this. Now, um, there, there is a thought that perhaps Nebuchadnezzar forgot the dream. And I believe the King James Version says uh, in verse 5, the king, when they say, tell your servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. In verse 5, uh, the King James Version has Nebuchadnezzar saying something like, um, the thing is gone from me. And you might infer from that that Nebuchadnezzar is saying, well, I forgot the dream. I can't tell it to you because I forgot it. You need to tell it to me. Um, but the ESV and other modern translations, I think even the New King James, renders this, the word from me is firm. Uh, the Young, Young, Young's literal translation says, the thing is gone the thing is gone out, or something like that, or this has gone out from me. And, and so the idea really is, what I've told you is what you're going to do. I'm not changing my mind. This is firm. Um, <clears throat> and so that, the only indication there that perhaps he forgot the dream <clears throat> is simply a bad translation in the King James. Um, and also we talked about the fact that it seems to be a recurring dream because it said he had dreams. Um, and also, if he had forgotten the dream... Then, what? I'm sorry? Exactly. The wise men would have just made something up and said, Oh, this is what you dreamt. Um, oh, I don't remember that. Well, that's what you dreamt. <laughs> I'm telling you, you, you asked me to tell you, you want me to help you or not? You know? and, and so it, it doesn't make sense that he uh, forgot the dream, but it makes a lot more sense than that he was trying to test them. Um, but the the Chaldeans, you know, Nebuchadnezzar says the word is firm for me. Well, the Chaldeans say the word is firm for us too. We can't do it. <laughs> there, there's no way that we can tell you the dream and the interpretation. No one has ever asked for this, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and so, what does Nebuchadnezzar accuse them of? Because they respond this way. Exactly, yes. In verse 8, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time. Alright, and he says, um, you, you're trying to buy time because you, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. In other words, until I forget about this. Or, you know, until... Um, until things change and I, I turn my attention somewhere else, I think is, is the idea there. <coughs> or, or perhaps until they come up with something, you know, to tell him, to appease him. Um, but basically the idea is buying for time. Um, the Chaldeans are at least smart enough to not attempt to pull one over on Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and... <laughs> It occurred to me that in modern times, if you had Nebuchadnezzar doing this, you'd probably get some fortune teller today. I mean, you, you see these people on TV, and they're very, very good. They're very good at, at, at pulling you in to their um, talent, their um, gift, they would say. Um, because you see them saying, oh, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of a person. They've got red hair. Oh, yeah, I know who that is, you know? And, and they, they lure you in like this. A modern-day fortune teller has more, more talent than these wise men do, I think, uh, for, for pulling the wool over your eyes. Anyway, that was just a, a side thought there. Um, all right, so Nebuchadnezzar is insistent. He realizes that this is important, that it needs 
a, a, a real interpretation and he's going to ask the impossible because he is the king. Um, all right. So, he gets furious because they say they can't do it. He commands that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. All right. What kind of a reaction is that? You think uh, you think that makes sense? What never? Okay. All right. Yeah. So this this is an act. This is a. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is a little desperate here. Um, I think, and he he really overreacts. I mean, are are all the wise men in the kingdom present for when Nebuchadnezzar makes this request? We know at least Daniel and Mishael and Hananiah and Azariah are not are not present. Um, because they learn about it from whom? From, I'm sorry? Yeah, and Daniel learned about it from who? From, from the commander, right? So here is Nebuchadnezzar. He gets, he gets angry and furious, and he decides that all the wise men have to be destroyed. And so the decree goes out, and Arioch, the captain of the guard, goes out to kill all of these wise men and comes to Daniel's door. And Daniel said, hey, what's going on? You know, He has no idea about this. Um, so, so think about the overreaction on Nebuchadnezzar's part, how furious he was that because this group of wise men that were in the, in the palace couldn't help him out, he says, I, I want all the wise men gone. Now what's that going to do to his kingdom? To his court. He's not going to have any wise men anymore. So he's kind of you know, cutting off his nose despite his face there. And especially if he gets rid of Daniel and his friends. Um, did I see a hand up? Okay. Alright. So, uh, so Arioch, the commander, the, the captain of the king's guard, um, shows up at Daniel's door and says... Uh, King says you have to die. <laughs> and look at what it says here. <clears throat> um, Daniel, in verse 14, in the, ESV, in the ESV, it says, Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, um, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. What a contrast here. We have Nebuchadnezzar who is acting in a rage and killing all of these people who really, you know, most of them are probably innocent. We certainly know Daniel and his friends are innocent. (laughs) They've had nothing to do with this. And Daniel replies with prudence and discretion. That's quite quite a contrast there. And how does he reply? Yeah, okay. It's like, uh, okay, well, why? <laughs> well, why is this such a big deal? Why is he so mad at all of us wise people? Um, and so the king uh, explains it to him. Um, no, not the, I'm not sorry, not the king, the captain who explains it to him. And um, which is interesting in and of itself. Because here is, is the captain. He's got strict orders to go and kill all of these wise men. But he stops to explain this to Daniel. Which kind of shows God's hand in things again, right? I mean, all, all this time we've had uh, God taking care of Daniel. We're only in chapter 2. God taking care of Daniel by, you know, giving him good health despite the food that he's eating. We've had God giving him wisdom and learning and interpretation of dreams. Um, God is giving, obviously, this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And God is uh, God uh, gave Daniel uh, favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. You know, even though he was saying, no, I don't want to eat this food. Um, he, they were patient with him. 
And here we have the king, the king's captain, instead of saying, I don't have to explain this to you, he stops to explain what's going on to Daniel. And Daniel somehow is able to go in and request an appointment with the king. I mean, think about how extraordinary this is. The, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, is furious with all the wise men, has ordered them all to be killed, and here comes one of them to, to make an appointment? To see the king? How bold. Um, and how extraordinary for Daniel to successfully do this. Um, and not just be uh, killed on the spot. Alright, so we see the hand of God in all of this. <coughs> Alright, any uh, questions or comments on this section before we, we continue? Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Right. Right. In, in the smallest things, too. Right. Right. Very good point. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> oh, and by the way, think about the boldness of Daniel as well. Because the next section we're going to read is where Daniel goes to his friends and says, hey, we need to pray to God for mercy. At this point, Daniel has only spoken to the you know the way the story is written. He's only spoken to the chief of uh, the, the the captain of the guard, and he immediately goes and makes this appointment. How bold of Daniel! Uh, courageous, not only to go to the king, but also to trust God that much that God will uh, provide what needs to be what needs to happen here. Okay, so want to didn't want to gloss over that point either. Um, Daniel seems to understand what Nebuchadnezzar understood, which is that this dream, there's something significant about this dream. God is speaking through this. And, and it's, as, as God's servant, it is up to him to, um, uh, to, to take care of this issue. Okay. All right, so now let's begin and read uh, verses 17 through 23. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Okay, so, so Daniel has made this appointment with the king. He has sealed his fate, because he's either got to go into the king and say, I can interpret the dream, or he has to say, uh, well, I'm no better than, than these other people. Um, and so he makes an appeal. He and, and his friends make an appeal to God to um, uh, concerning, it says, concerning the mystery um, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men. And it's interesting that... Uh, you know, we might look at that and say, well, that's a little selfish, isn't it? <laughs> he's not asking that the rest of the wise men not be destroyed. He's just asking, don't destroy, don't destroy us. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's, not, it's not wrong to pray for our own welfare. Um, 
and uh, and certainly the other wise men are not servants of God. Um, so you know God can do with them what what He wills. Um, and so something happened that night in verse nineteen, and Daniel receives his own vision. Um, a night, a vision of the night. It says, and he, the the uh, mystery is revealed to him. Um, and so, at this point, we have kind of a break in the narrative. <laughs> We've been, you know, reading all the events happening in succession up until this time, and now we take time to bless God with Daniel. We take time to. Hear Daniel's prayer. We don't. We're, we're not privy to what exactly Daniel prayed in the first prayer, but now we're going to stop and take time out to praise God. And so he says, and he begins by saying, "Blessed be the name of God forever and ever." To whom belong wisdom and might? Now this is a contrast to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar thinks that wisdom and might belong to him, and we've seen him. Flex those muscles. He's got all the wise men. All the nations that he conquers, he brings all the wise men into his court. And they're going to be his. So he's got all the wisdom, he thinks. And he has all the might. Because when those wise men don't turn out to be so wise, he's, going to, he's got the power to just kill them all. Right? That's, so Nebuchadnezzar has the wisdom and the might. And Daniel affirms that that's not true. That God has the wisdom and the might. He does what Nebuchadnezzar cannot. He changes times and seasons. God has that much power. And no one else does. Um, He removes kings and sets up kings. It doesn't matter how powerful Nebuchadnezzar is. He's only there because God wants him to be there. Because God has allowed him to be there. And he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And I think that is a a very interesting way to say that. Okay? He gives wisdom to the wise. I think there's two things we can glean from that and, and the next statement. And knowledge to those who have understanding. Number one... God, those who are wise, are wise because of who? God. God gives them wisdom. Those who have understanding have knowledge because of who? God. Those who have understanding, God gives them that knowledge. But I think the other, I think there's an inverse there as well. Those who are wise seek wisdom from God. Those who have understanding seek knowledge from God. So it works both ways, right? You are wise because God makes you wise, but you are wise because you seek wisdom from God. Um, And I think we see that that same idea expressed in the Proverbs as well. Um, Okay. And um, And so Daniel continues... Uh, to talk about how God can reveal mysteries, the deep and hidden things. And so he has done in this case by revealing the mystery to Daniel. Um, And he, he, he rounds it up in verse 23. For you have given me Wisdom and might. How did he begin this prayer? Uh huh. And to whom belong wisdom and might? You have given, now he says, you have given me wisdom and might. And so we see Daniel saying, you have shared your very nature with me. Um, and isn't that what we all we all want? We want we want to share God's nature. Um, that's what we're seeking: wisdom, and then the nature of God to be in us. And that's what Daniel uh, 
That's what Daniel expresses here. God has transferred wisdom and might to him. Um, okay. Just a few minutes here. <clears throat> trying to read my notes, excuse me. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's turn for just a second to 1 Kings chapter 8. Um, I'm going the wrong way. 1 Kings chapter 8. And um, there's a prayer at the dedication of this temple that Solomon gives. <clears throat> Uh, beginning in verse uh, 46. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them, and give them to an enemy, so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near. Yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, We have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly, if they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their enemies who carried them captive and pray to you toward their land which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your dwelling place their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions that they have committed against you and grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried them captive that they may have compassion on them. For they are your people and your heritage, which you have, which you brought out of Egypt from the midst of the iron furnace. Let your eyes be open to the plea of your servant and to the plea of your people Israel, giving ear to them whenever they call to you. For you separated them from among all the peoples of the earth to be your heritage, as you declared through Moses your servant, when you brought out our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. You see, Solomon kind of foresaw this very thing happening the people sinning and being carried away captive. And he asked God to remember them and hear their prayers so that and have compassion on them so that their captors would have compassion on them. And that's, that's exactly what's happening here with Daniel. And so, you think perhaps Daniel knew this scripture? Knew this prayer of Solomon? Yeah. I think I think he did. I think he knew. And perhaps that's why he was able to answer instead of going all nuts and uh, just you know fearing for his life and begging and pleading Arioch, you know, please spare me. Oh no, why has God forsaken me here? You know, I I don't understand what's going on. Instead of reacting in that way, he reacts with discretion and prudence. Because he knows what Solomon said. And so one thing that we can learn from this as, as we close is that if we have the knowledge of God in us, if we are wise because we have sought the wisdom of God, then we will be able to act, react appropriately in times of adversity. Um, and so it's incumbent upon us to understand the Scripture. Um, He's in his in Caleb's notes here, uh, which I, th I think he got from Nathan Ward. He told me um, there's a, a quote here. It says, "If we spent even half the passion on seeking seeking God that we spend on seeking amusement, our lives would be far different from those of the people around us." And that's from I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. Dugid, D U G U I D. No, nobody I've heard of before. Perhaps I should have. But it's a good quote, you know, and we need to spend more time, as I'm sure Daniel did, seeking the wisdom of God. Um, okay, so any final comments or or questions or before we uh, before we close this morning? I appreciate your your attention and your participation. All right, well, we will. Uh, Closes up there, and we'll continue on with chapter 2 on Thursday.